off. Um, thanks again for uh, for coming on to speak to us. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the role that you do at the moment um, and how you got into it? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been working in the non-profit sector for my entire career. Um, bar a couple of short experiences, I've never had a for-profit role. Um, I had one or two internships in the profit sector and sort of went, no, nope, not a good fit. So I've been in non-profit my whole career and uh, in recent years specialising in food. Um, the reason I'm looking around at the moment is because I have a cheeky two-year-old in the background who I've always got to have one eye on. I am London-based and I uh, work for a charity called the Mayor's Fund for London. And the Mayor's Fund for London is an independent charity despite its name, um, but we're based in City Hall. It was set up by Boris Johnson in 2009 as a social mobility charity, so supporting young people from a background of disadvantage to create meaningful careers in what they want to do um, and essentially escape the, the cycle of poverty. Um, I think when Boris Johnson set it up, um, he had a, a sort of perspective that it was about helping those young people who are really brilliant but who have been born into poverty to get out of it. Um, and actually I'd say that our opinion is that all young people are brilliant and we're helping as many as we can um, to create those meaningful careers. Um, about three years ago the organisation started working in food insecurity. It wasn't something that was um, uh, an area of specialism for the charity. The areas of specialism were employment and education, but I think increasingly they saw how food insecurity was in impacting on young people and preventing them from engaging with the employment and education opportunities that they had. They particularly saw that uh, food insecurity for young children, both in term time and outside of term time, uh, could impact on educational attainment. And so they set up a program called Kitchen Social, Mm -hmm. Kitchen Social is focused on supporting young people who are not in school, so people in uh, children in school holidays to access nutritious food, to access enriching activities and to be part of really positive community networks. And about a year and a half ago, I came in as the programme manager for Kitchen Social um, and the head of social inclusion at the Mayor's Fund for London to oversee that piece of work and then our wider work around children's well-being and ensuring that young people's well-being is the basis upon which we're then able to do that additional work in terms of education and employment with them. So you've, um, you've obviously you brought a lot of um, experience to that role. Um, pr prior to that you've worked in um, various different food roles. You've worked, uh, you've also um, undergone some academic training and um, working with Professor Tim Lang who's a, a world expert um, on food insecurity issues. Um, Jessica, could you kind of give us a bit of a background on what um, what that has taught you on looking at issues of food poverty? Now, you've been, you've been working in this area for a long time. We both worked together in London um, about 10 years ago. Um, I think I said in a tweet um, No, not earlier. 10 years ago. Don't say that. It was. It was. Like my, age and, my hair um, was different, Clara. But it was 2014, but, 2015. So just uh, about okay. half, half of that. I was there a little bit before, but yeah, so in, in terms of the academic pursuits, of, <laughs> I would, yeah, I would want to, um, it's me, Clara, not you. Um, in terms of your, uh, just in terms of that experience, so bringing an academic perspective to it, I guess the, the thing I was thinking about was, um, so te 10 years ago, when I started at Food Cycle, food poverty wasn't the first thing you put into an application, a funding application. Yeah. It wasn't a term that existed. Um, trust or trust had prevalent food banks but they weren't ubiquitous and they weren't actually part of the system. So some of the, some of the things we always struggled with, I don't know what your view was, at, at the time of running that organisation, um, are we solving a problem or actually are we becoming intrinsic to um, systemic poverty issues within society that, um, that, that we're not changing or fixing? I don't know what your views are from your kind of academic perspective and, and working in food poverty for that, that long, there's not an easy solution to that. But it's No, and it's a really good thing. question and it's a question that I ask myself a lot. So yeah. um, I've worked in food insecurity since 2014. Prior to that I was with a charity that worked with young people on um, amplifying their voice, so mm -hmm. debate and public speaking and things like that. So um, an area where 
you know, completely disconnected areas. So I came into food insecurity in 2014, which some people like yourself have been working in food insecurity for lots longer. So I did come into somewhat of an established sector. In other ways, I look back now and I think, my goodness, we've come so far. Mm -hmm. You know, we are so far on from 2014. So I think that um, one of the things that struck me when I joined the sector was how people's response was still about food. It was still about, we've noticed that there is a deficit mm -hmm. in people's lives, in households, particularly people who are low income. And we are responding to that deficit in a very simple way of supplying what the deficit is, which in this case is food. And I think there was a lot of organizations who were responding in that way because it is, of course, you know, the first thing that you think of is where well, you've got a problem, you're missing something, I have access to that, I'll supply it, problem solved. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of that kind of thinking going on. Certainly not in academic circles, yeah. um, but academic circles uh, who were far advanced in this thinking and who had also, you know, knew a lot about the American situation and about the Canadian situation hadn't necessarily come together with in practice yet. So there was a lot of people, a lot of practitioners on the ground responding to this issue um, without a huge amount of academic input. And that's something that I've seen change hugely. So I had the privilege, whilst I started working in the sector in 2014, I also was um, joining that same year, joining the Centre for Food Policy to do a Food Policy Masters. I had the privilege of working with Professor Tim Lang, Professor Corinna Hawkes, um, Professor Martin Carraher, brilliant, brilliant people particularly Martin, who has spent his entire life looking at food insecurity, uh, injustices, inequalities in food, um, and who has, you know, brilliant, brilliant perspectives and um, is a very, um, yeah, just a fantastic person to be led by. So on the one hand, you know, I was in a sector where we were still, you know, we were still very young as a sector and we were still approaching issues without uh, the level of thought and the level of um, understanding that we have today. But on the other hand, I was in a room with uh, Martin Carraher and Corinna Hawkes and Tim Lang, who were light years ahead of us and who were thinking about, you know, able to look back at the American experience of food insecurity, the Canadian experience of food insecurity, the Brazilian experience of legislation around the right to food and able to draw on those lessons from other countries and apply that to what we were seeing in the UK. Um, and so I was very fortunate to have those two influences. And what that meant was that I could um, I think I could support the development of the social enterprise that I was working for in terms of being a little bit more informed, being a little bit more intelligent and really be able to question what we were doing and why and understand that, you know, it wasn't about supplying food to people without food, or at least it certainly wouldn't have a long lasting or an impactful legacy to undertake that activity. Um, I think there is, I think we all agree that of course there is a need for supplying food to people without food, that that is something that we still do through the Trussell Trust, through other food banks, through the food banks that are part of the independent food aid network. But we all now collectively understand that that's just simply the first step to supporting people, mm -hmm. that the response to food poverty, the response to food insecurity is not food. The response to food insecurity is, you know, established welfare systems, it is employment, but decent, fair employment with decent, fair pay. Mm -hmm. That is a living wage. Um, and so we do really understand that whilst food plays an important role in food poverty, actually, a lot of the time, we're not talking about food. We're talking about so many other aspects of the economy, of society, of, of how people's lives are impacted by these situations. And when you say that, because it, it's it's something that ring, rings really true to me in terms of um, food poverty and poverty, actually, because you can't segment poverty. Um, there are deep structural and um, systemic issues that um, that you know drive poverty. So actually, you have to deal with all aspects, especially with um, looking at food poverty. Some of the, the people that would present themselves to food banks and whatever else would have um, been sanctioned through benefit sanctions and, and that was maybe one of the reasons why they were coming from this very transactional I, I need food, I am hungry, therefore um, I'll come into this, this service. 
Can you tell us a little bit about the company shop model and the community shops model that you um, were you were charged with um, expanding to different areas? We spoke about before. We had Goldthorpe in um, in, in Yorkshire, uh, Barnsley, yeah. Barnsley, and um, then you know different hubs in West Norwood in London. Very different communities. Very different in terms of the the communities they serve. Um, but it's a solution to looking at what is a solution to looking at basically the structural inequalities rather than just providing food. Yeah, so firstly I'll say um, I have argued in the past and I think I, I still do uh, think that yes, I wholeheartedly agree with the fact that we are talking about poverty. We have always been talking about poverty yeah. and the relationship between poverty and food insecurity oh, okay. whilst being a very close relationship, um, mm. you know, it's, it's one and the same. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to uh, That's all right. eye on my toddler and one eye on you. So, um, you know, th those two things I think are the same thing, but I don't agree with only talking about poverty. So I have heard people say previously, we don't need to talk about food poverty. That's not really a thing. We need to talk about poverty. Um, you know, let's not segment it off. And actually, I would, I would gently counter that with, whilst I do agree that the focus and the um, energy should be going into resolving poverty. I do think we need a response in the short term to food insecurity and food poverty. And the reason is that people don't recover from food insecurity and food poverty. You know, they, this is something that people are experiencing in the immediate, in the present. This is something that is impacting on children's development, mm -hmm. the way that their brains develop, their emotional development, their mental health, their physical health, um, you know, even to the extent of the height they will grow to. It's something that impacts on adults' health and particularly around diet related disease. And it will shorten the lives of adults to be to have multiple or ongoing experiences of food insecurity. People don't come back from that you know and this is one of the reasons why people get stuck into cycles of poverty is because their health is negatively impacted to the fact to the to the point where they're unable to re fully recover and so on that basis we do need an immediate response to food insecurity to food poverty that supports the people who are experiencing it in the immediate to get access um whilst we're looking at in terms of the there's an upstream response it's, it's absolutely about poverty mm -hmm. But we do need to find that balance between the two. So I've always argued that we do need to focus on food poverty and food insecurity as well as talking about poverty. And um, when you're so obviously the definition of food poverty is about having access to healthy, nutritious food. So that's as, as opposed to being hungry. Um, and and I guess those factors you've been speaking about where um, children at school they might they might be going hungry or they might not have access to healthy, nutritious, readily available um, foods. So in terms of the, the work you're doing just now and the impacts that you're seeing in London, what, what can you kind of say about that in terms of the, the, the food, the, in terms of the, the projects that are being delivered, which are about healthy, nutritious food, access to that, and then also access to attainment? What, what have been the impacts? So, you asked me a question but, um, just prior that I completely ignored the back. I'm going to come back to that. That's fine. Yeah, so, well, the, the two are connected. It's, yeah, yeah. It, um, let me touch very briefly on Community Shop because I think the two are really connected. Yeah. So yeah. Community Shop um, is, is a social supermarket chain. It was my first job to grow the network around um, the UK, my first job in this sector. And a social supermarket is a model that's fairly frequently used over in Europe. And what we did was we took that model and we brought it into the UK. We made it appropriate for the circumstances here. And then we grew that around the country. And basically the way it works is very high quality surplus food is taken out of the food supply chain right at the top of the chain so from the processors and packages and manufacturers and it's taken into communities in a environment that looks like a supermarket so no different to your tesco express your sainsbury's local the only difference is when you walk through the doors and you'll remember this kieran from visiting me in london which you did many times yeah. when you walk through the doors um the food on the shelves is all of different brands so you might have waitrose next to asda next to tesco and we were the only place in the whole country where we were allowed to do that so it was quite special and on top of that the food changes every day so i would always say to our members we will always have cheese every single day we will have cheese on the shelves some days it'll be mozzarella 
and it'll be cheddar and other days it'll be ricotta and it'll be cream cheese um so you do have to be a little bit flexible and a little bit creative but there was always cheese on the shelves so at any one time we would have about 900 product lines in store um, we also had a cafe and that was based on the surplus food that was coming in and that did breakfast and lunch on a daily basis and then we had a learning and development area and the learning and development area was about supporting people to create relationships within the community and about supporting people to understand what it was they wanted to do with their lives and help each other achieve that. So when we say learning and development, it wasn't about classes, it wasn't about lectures, it was about creating safe spaces for the community to support one another. Now the reason why I wanted to touch on that first was because I think when we talk about the relationship between food and poverty, the relationship between supporting people in the immediate and in the long term, the way that we approached the community shop was that people who were experiencing food insecurity and food poverty or one or the other for the most part were in so much stress mm. on yeah. a daily basis so much stress thinking where's their next meal coming from would they be able to provide nutritious food for their children so much psychological stress that they weren't able to think about a lot of other things because that really takes over your brain and I've been in this position not as an adult but as a student um, living abroad I've been in the position where I haven't had very much money and I have had I to would been like more crackers okay we'll see what we can do buddy and I've had to uh, you know think really think about where my next meal is coming from and I really sympathize that when you're thinking about where your next meal is coming from that becomes really overwhelming so what we understood about the supply of food into households via the social supermarket model where food is 70 percent off rrp so people were paying about 30 percent of what you'd mm. pay if you were buying from a retail store because of a membership model so, they want so, membership yeah. model yeah so people would come and register with us as members they'd get a membership card they'd swipe into the building and they could come and do as much shopping as they wanted to and as their household needed um to be a member all they needed to do was live in that local community and be in receipt of some form of means tested benefit whatever that might be so people of all sorts of circumstances uh, joined us as members we had people from every age from 18 all the way up to 80 um, and in all sorts of circumstances some people between jobs some people at home with children and uh, and we supported them in whatever way they wanted to be supported but what the food allowed us to do was build a scaffold around those individuals so those individuals no longer had to think about where their next meal was coming from. They knew where their next meal was coming from. They knew that they could come to the store, they could afford the food there. The food was really good quality. You know, we have Waitrose, we had Acado, we had all the best brands. So we had lots and lots um, to offer them. And they were able to, if they had issues with regards to preparing food at home, Finn Robin, can you come down from the desk please? Thank you. Um, <laughs> If they had issues preparing food at home, then we also had the cafe, so they knew that they could have a meal that was cooked on site by our chef, Patricia. And once that scaffold was around them, we freed them from the psychological stress of food insecurity. And that's when we were able to work with them on a longer term basis. That's when we were able to say, what is it that you'd like to do with your life? What is it that would improve the quality of your life? You know, is that around sorting out a debt issue? Is that around going back to college and getting a qualification in something that you'd like to go into work for? Is that around finding a new job? Is it not actually around any of those outcomes? Is it just around being better connected to your community and having friends in the local area and feeling like you're socially engaged in a positive community? Whatever it is, we're here to support you in doing that. Um, and so I think that, you know, we, we understood and we got that, we got that right. I think we understood that the food supply allows you the ability to then support people in, in terms of individual development, community development. Now, I'm not saying that that's just the answer in terms of the wider picture in the UK, but I think where we talk about the balance between longer term initiatives, shorter term initiatives, supporting people in the immediate and how we need to do that if we don't support people with food insecurity in the immediate we can't do that other stuff sure. people don't yeah. have energy you know even if we're talking about marching in the street and demanding our human rights for food even if we're talking about that 
people don't have the energy to do that if they're hungry. You know, people have the energy to do things when they're well fed, when they're part of a connected community, when they're supported to meet with that community and talk about the issues facing them, when they've got the ability to spend time together and decide what it is as a community they want to do. And the food simply underpins that. Um, in, in Kitchen Social, it's uh, a slightly different model in that we're working only with children. We work only during school holidays and we work out of community venues. So we don't have um, specific sites for our activity. We work out of theatres, out of adventure playgrounds, out of churches, out of any community venue that will have us. So much like Food Cycle, we okay. go to where there is community space in communities where there is a level of deprivation. Mm -hmm. And we do holiday provision. So it's not just about food. It's not just about bringing kids in and serving a meal or sending them home with a packed lunch. It's about bringing communities together. It's about giving communities that space. It's about underpinning all of that activity with great quality food. And it's about saying to communities, you know what, this is your space. We're here to support you. What is it that you'd like to do? What activities would you like to do? You know, would you, is there anything that you'd like to talk to or talk to us about whilst you're here? Is there anything we can support you with? So very light touch on that side of things. When we evaluated our program, we knew that we were doing great stuff with food. We know that the food that we produce is really good quality, really nutritious. But actually, when we evaluated our program, the thing that came out strongest in the evaluation is that kitchen social is places where really strong community networks are formed. That was the most significant change that kitchen social was having, mm -hmm. was that there was a space for people to come together, become communities, become tight knit, support one another. And that is where the long lasting impact of these models are. And all of that just is un simply underpinned with good quality food. So like with a community shop, we are, so I've got a child dive bombing off my desk. So if I'm shaking, this I, is it's, it's all, all good, no shaking. And uh, <laughs> I'm very impressed with the, Multitasking skills. That child knows fine well that mummy's busy and so you can get away with more than normal. <laughs> so it's, I, I, I mean, it's a really, um, it's an area that lots of people are looking at just now in terms of quality provision and especially during COVID at the moment, obviously access to food for, for kids. Um, we're seeing obviously disrupted um, school timetables and that's affecting um, young people's access to food and children's access to food. Um, what what effects have you seen during this period during COVID um, in relation in relation to access to food and to young people's lack of attainment or working for all of those sort of issues? Yeah, so I think um, Kitchen Social for I haven't explained the program in great depth, but Kitchen Social is the largest and most established holiday provision provider in London. Mm -hmm. We have been going since two thousand seventeen, and we train and fund and support organizations based in the community to put on really high quality provision for children okay. and that includes sports it includes great quality food it includes arts and crafts theater um, and it's all about children having a really enjoyable meaningful break from school where they are part of a really positive community atmosphere it's a really gorgeous program i'm very very proud to be a part of it and so when we uh when we started becoming aware of this current situation the current crisis and when it became increasingly evident that schools were closing um i think we faced a choice you know do we uh close down activity and you know i would have loved to be furloughed and be at home with my kid and focus on childcare. and i did gently suggest to my boss that that would be my ideal uh, is to be sent home for this period or do we step up because actually we have a lot of experience in supporting children when they're not in school. And even though obviously this is not a school holiday, actually the, the issues are the same. Children without access to free school meals. We have 400,000 children in London who are food insecure, who are low food secure households. Um, and we have 196,000 who are eligible for free school meals. And therefore, 204,000 are not receiving government vouchers. They're not receiving any uh, additional support from their um, schools, or potentially not most of them won't be. And these are the children that we are particularly worried about. We're also worried about children who are coming into this situation, parents having lost jobs, parents having reduced incomes, who are starting to experience food insecurity where they haven't before. 
So we realized that we were in a really great position to respond to this. We um, have started running an emergency response. Well, we started running an emergency response within a week of schools closing in 30 locations across London, where we are funding and supporting community groups to produce meals, to distribute um, pre-prepared meals, hampers for families, activity packs that include art supplies and books but also well-being support so checking in with families chatting to kids che checking in online making sure kids are doing okay emotionally um, and they've done a really incredible job and we are supporting and serving thousands of children every week what we're seeing we've surveyed some of our families we've talked to our hub leaders we're trying to get a really good picture of what's happening on the ground of course because of the travel restrictions we haven't been able to do a lot of visits we haven't ourselves been able to be on site as much as we'd like um, and so we're talking to our hub leaders to really understand what's happening and talking to our families what we're seeing is families saying that um, you know their incomes are being reduced but also that they are experiencing um, supply issues so they're not able to buy what they need in the local shops mm -hmm. prices of food are rising so where they may, may have been able to afford things previously they're now finding that their budgets are being squeezed for food and that even the simple things are, are uh, taking more of their income you know you only have to look online at various different supermarkets that are online to see that a lot of offers have been taken off you know the supermarkets are really utilizing this opportunity to make money so where you would have gone on and seen two for ones or half price deals there are not very many of them around so we're with and a lot of our the families that we work with are bargain shoppers in that regard you know they go out to the shop and they buy everything that's on sale and on offer um so Certainly food prices, we're seeing a rise in those and families are telling us, you know, before we were just about managing, but now we're being really, really pushed. On top of that, we've had around 30% of families um, suggesting that they've got a decrease in their household income. Um, and we've got, we know that there are 900 additional children in one borough and the borough that we're based as a charity, there are 900 children who are, who've just moved into being eligible for free school meals in the last few weeks. So. The, the total number wow. was 6,500. It's now 7,400. So, you know, we're seeing really large impacts. Uh, that's a 15% increase. We're seeing really large impacts in terms of families who are receiving welfare benefits now who weren't. Um, so we, we know what's happening on the ground. We can see that and we, we are talking to our families about what the pressures are. We also have um, parents at home who are trying to work from home who are now uh, struggling in terms of time and in terms of being able to provide childcare, being able to work, being able to produce meals. So we're certainly having families telling us that actually as well as having a lack of food and not being able to afford good quality food, on top of that they're really pushed for time because they're balancing so many different things um, and I think a lot of us can, can really sympathise and empathise with that. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a challenging picture on the ground. We've been able to work in 30 communities of high deprivation to provide a response through community organisations that includes you know, activities and, and food and wellbeing support. But we also know that there are lots of communities where that's not happening, where there is very little support, where the council is only responding to people who are medically shielding or elderly. And actually children, for the most part, are going um, forgotten. So one of the campaigns that we've been working on, is, on, a, on as an organisation is around the right to food for children. And we've been working on that campaign for um, about uh, a year and a half or so now and and that's around you know ensuring that children have access to nutritious food 365 days a year that the children who are eligible for free school meals also have some form of government support during school holidays and that the eligibility for free school meals is larger to take into account all low-income households and not just the very small group of households who you'd say are in very severe poverty but actually all households that are experiencing poverty. Um, so that's something that we've been pushing. That's something that um, you know we've we've been writing to the government to ask them to extend the vouchers to a larger group of children, to extend the vouchers over the Easter period, over the half term period, over the summer period, um, and and to do more around children and food insecure children. In terms of in terms, I guess of um, what you're seeing in London and your wider role as head of inclusion. Um, we're possibly seeing the 
the calm before the storm, I guess, of, um, you know, people that are furloughed at the moment, people are waiting to come off furlough, more people were paid unemployed, we're heading towards a recession, um, so th things are potentially going to get worse. Um, in terms of the sector, in terms of what you can see, so you're looking at models like company shop, which mm -hmm. have, a, I guess, an element of, well, a huge element of trading, working with suppliers like Waitrose and Ocado to get food at the very top of the food chain before it would go anywhere else. So they're not able to purchase that food at a uh, very small amount of cost and trade through that model. There's then other models we see in London where they're dependent on philanthropy, on, on grant support. On, there's going to be a huge pressure within the sector. Looking around you and looking at the different models that you can see within in London, specifically looking, I guess, at supporting um, food insecurity and so on, there's going to be more pressure. What 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 are you? What are the early indications saying to you about the sector in the in London? And undoubtedly, there's going to be more pressure. What do you think that um, third sector organisations will be looking to do in terms of sustaining themselves longer term? So sustaining themselves longer term. Um, yeah, that's a really good question because, of course, we are the sector that supports people when they are having, you know, experiencing poverty and having difficulties financially, particularly. And we ourselves as a sector. Okay, can you give me two minutes and I'll go get you a cracker? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we are also, as a, a sector, really, really impacted financially. So our our organisation, my programme, never mind our organisation, my programme, um, Kitchen Social lost £70,000 of funding overnight uh, because that was £70,000 that was committed by the restaurant industry and of okay. course understandably when the restaurant industry closed down they, the funders said you know chances are we, we can't fund yeah. it because yeah. they were funding it through sales of meals so without the sales of meals that funding wasn't available um, so very understandable on behalf of the sector but obviously puts us in a challenging position in terms of our financial uh, planning and what we were hoping to raise in order to do the activity that we do. Now we've been lucky as an organisation because we've been able to access some of the emergency funding that has been set out for COVID response. Mm -hmm. Many charities haven't because um, their response is not necessarily seen as being COVID specific. Sure. Yeah, so yeah. there might be far more demand for their services but yeah. it's not being seen as something that's different because of the, the current issue. Or they, you know, perhaps they uh, are spending a lot more money, but they haven't seen a decline in income or whatever it might be. So yeah. there are a lot of organisations who haven't been able to access those pots. Um, I mean, what I'd like to say is, is that there will be, will be financial support forthcoming from the government to sustain the work of the third sector to support people within communities. I don't think that's true. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. We yeah. all know that we don't have a sympathetic government. We we have a government who, um, and I say this with Boris Johnson having founded our charity, but I think yeah. we, we have a government who um, believes in the power of big society. I think that idea still prevails. We've been warned about the recession, of, and off the back of that, austerity being reintroduced. So I think we know from the messages we've received mm -hmm. that we're not going to suddenly see a large income coming in from that source. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the um, businesses who traditionally uh, support charities, they themselves are financially struggling. You know, the mm -hmm. business sector is going to be so impacted. That I think that source is, is really impacted. Um, and I think, you know, when I consider where there might be trading income and the ability for traditional charities to um, diversify income, mm -hmm. you know, and we've thought a lot about this with regards to Kitchen Social and with regards to our future planning. We're talking about, um, you know, potentially months and years of development, you know, to take a traditional charity model, be that yeah. established or fairly new, and to um, generate an income and a revenue that is impactful. Mm -hmm. You know, that's such a long process. That's not something that you can, can do in a matter of weeks. And so my, I don't want to sound bleak i don't want to send people away feeling really bleak about this but um you know i think we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us as a sector mm -hmm. i think that we can only do as a sector we can only do as much as we're funded to do mm -hmm. you know we are we obviously have 
uh, a lot of volunteers and we're seeing a lot of community groups setting up mutual aid groups things like that but even they can't share resources unless they have resources um, the welfare sector as we know is inadequate and i think what we're going to see is a growing gap in between what we do as a sector and where we fill those gaps in the welfare sector and the welfare sector itself and uh, unfortunately and very sadly i think we're going to see more people falling through those gaps um and, and we don't have a magic silver bullet no sorry no, <laughs> no not um, <laughs> it's a really that's, answer isn't it it's a it's a realistic i think answer and it's one that i'm um, actually you as someone that's uh, delivering change within community supporting people are you're completely aware of and i'm sure it's the within london i asked that question without with, with kind of knowing the answer, there's there's going to be some tough decisions potentially that um, organisations are going to have to make. I mean, even 10 years ago, looking at the food cycle model, you know, we had different models there. There was one that was a community cafe and we had to look at, was that a sustainable model? It wasn't. So therefore, we had to take some tough decisions um, right about that. Um, and we'll, we'll see more and more of that. Hopefully, um, some positives in terms of maybe potential collaborations with the third sector. Um, but certainly we need to think about as funders and as um, people that support the third sector in London, in Scotland, across the UK solutions um, in order to, to support them, to support communities. Yeah, I think, and I, I come from a background of surplus food, as, as you do as well. Yeah. And I think there are, you know, you can say things like, well, we've got surplus food as a resource and we can use that. That's a free resource and we can do a lot with that. And that is true. And I, I absolutely you know, don't take away from the value of that resource. We used to we used to call ourselves social alchemists because we would be taking a resource that was considered waste and we'd be turning it into gold in the sense of social capital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't think it's a solution. And I think this is where I sometimes differ from other people in the sector where that's not a solution. That's that's a byproduct of the industry. It's a great resource if you have access to it, you can do some nice stuff with it. But when we're talking about large scale long term solutions that's not it yeah yeah and yeah. and i think it's um there are lots of ways we can act there are lots of collaborations we can have there are lots of things that we can do um but when it comes to long-term solutions across the whole of the uk we have to be talking about national government funding we have to be talking about uh, local authority and council services you know we have to be talking about the really big policy changes and policy ideas in order to to really you know um demand and secure long-term change and i think i from working in the industry or the sector i should say industry always sounds a bit uh working in the sector from 2014 i think that's what i've become quite committed to is that single actions are important and single actions are important for so many reasons and single actions can change communities individual communities and individual lives but it can't change the world yeah and that we always used to tell the story sorry to get all philosophical on you but we always used to tell the story about starfish do you know that one i don't no, no. Okay. Tell it. how many people are on this call right now 16 people so starfish parable so there's a old man walking along the beach and there's been a storm overnight and hundreds of thousands of starfish have washed up onto the beach and since the storm has settled the sun has come out so these starfish are drying out in the sun and most of them are starting to die and this old man walks along and he sees a young boy picking up a starfish one in each hand running down to the water and throwing them in the water and the old man as he approaches him laughs and says what are you doing you're not making any difference and the young boy picks up a starfish in one hand, starfish in the other, runs down to the water and throws them in and says, well, I made a difference to those starfish. And I think we always used to talk about that, yeah, those yeah, starfish, yeah. and the importance of individual people, the importance of households and individual lives, and how, you know, we, even if it was small scale change, it was still important. But I think when we're talking about a crisis on the scale of which we're talking about, when we're talking about food insecurity at the scale of which it has now reached, yes saving starfish individually is important and you know we would all grab starfish and run to the ocean and throw them in but we have to be demanding so much more than that um you know our asks of the government our asks of local government and national government um both in terms of policy and resource have to now be so much higher and have to be able to respond to that by 
well, yeah, creating a starfish collecting machine, I suppose. Thanks very much for your time, Farah. That's a lovely <laughs> um, position to, to to close on. And um, yeah, th thanks for your time. Thank you for um, you made some.